Is it time for another Reformation? This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome to the Thursday edition of Truth to Ponder, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Today, I want to take a break from some of the news headlines, and I have a guest on the program I really believe you need to hear. He's someone I met a number of years ago at Toccoa Falls College. He has since retired. He is a professor emeritus. His name is Dr. Donald T. Williams, or Don Williams as I knew him back in the day. He recently wrote a book about how the church needs a new reformation today. He's a speaker, like I say, college professor and an author, and he has a lot to share. We can look at all the world's problems all day long, but until we have a foundation in our faith, until we even know how to share our faith, what can we do? And so I reached out to Professor Williams to ask him to be a guest on the program today and to talk about some of these particular issues facing the church. And I know that he can give it to you in terms that are easy to understand. And so I welcome my guest today, Dr. Donald T. Williams. And and let me start with this. Kind of give me an update of what you have been doing. I know you've now retired from Toccoa Falls. So so what has been going on in your life? Well, uh, since I stopped teaching full-time at Toccoa Falls, I have been surviving the pandemic uh, and... Uh, taking advantage of the opportunities that God gives me. I just got back from uh, two weeks teaching at the International Academy of uh, Christian Apologetics, uh, Evangelism, and Human Rights in Strasbourg, France, for example. Uh, So I've I've been continuing my work as an apologist. Uh, A couple of years ago, I I published a book called... um, the Young Christian's Survival Guide, common questions that young Christians are asked about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith answered, in which I deal with 19 different questions that, that people are getting today. And uh, what a lot of even, even young apologetics uh, nerds don't realize is that the questions are changing. They're shifting dramatically um, we still have to be prepared to deal with the traditional questions about the historicity and the accuracy of Scripture. But increasingly, if, if you're on a secular campus, you're not going to get that. Mm-hmm. You're going to get, the Bible's an immoral book. Who cares if it's inerrant? If it's inerrant, that just makes it worse, because it's immoral. It teaches and promotes genocide and racism and slavery and the oppression of women mm-hmm. and homophobia. That's what they say. That's what they and say. And all these other evil, evil things. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so uh, I discovered my last few years of teaching apologetics on the college level that, that, that um, even the kids who were interested in that subject before they got to my class, they were well prepared to defend the Bible's authenticity, its historicity. They got caught flat-footed by those questions. And so half of this book is dealing with uh, how do we respond to that kind of attack, which increasingly is what people are going to be dealing with. Um, The other uh, side of my ministry is, and and it's a natural bridge as an apologist, because C.S. Lewis was the greatest apologist of the 20th century, and that is that I'm probably best known as an Inklings scholar. Uh, I do a lot of work about uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, their writings. Um, Probably my uh, most important book is Deeper Magic, the theology behind the writings of C.S. Lewis, which is the only, it's the go-to book for Lewis's theology because it's the only one that is both comprehensive and critical. As you, you've got other books that basically are just a summary of what Lewis's theology was. Mm-hmm. To mm-hmm. me, that's kind of pointless. Why, why take Lewis's brilliant prose, translate it into my mediocre prose, and, and pass that off as a book? Be better off to just go read Lewis. That either it's just a summary or it only deals with one doctrine or a, a group of doctrines. I go through the 
standard table of contents of a systematic theology text, and and from every single thing that Lewis ever uh, published, and some things that he didn't, I ask what was Lewis's teaching, what was his perspective on this topic, and what are its strengths and weaknesses as a guide to biblical truth. Has a lot of strengths, has a few weaknesses. Uh, but I give the analysis and the critique that is just desperately needed. I mean, Lewis is arguably the most influential Christian thinker of the 20th century. And uh, I, I run into people who, who, who think Lewis can do no wrong, and I run into people who think that uh, he was a heretic. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, and, and because uh, he doesn't line up with them on some doctrine or other. And people who people really need to have an objective, appreciative, but also critical at the right points evaluation of Lewis as a teacher of Christian truth, because he, uh, you know, uh, if you if you uh, if you exempt Billy Graham, mm-hmm. Lewis probably got more Christian ideas into more heads than any other person in the 20th century. So it's pretty important that we have a realistic assessment of uh, of where he was as a teacher of Christian truth, and he, and he was in most points a very good one. In some points, uh, we need to say, "Wait a minute." Then uh, my book on Tolkien, an encouraging thought, the biblical worldview in uh, the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, Tolkien wasn't. Like Lewis, he didn't write the kind of things that let you actually talk about his theology, uh, not the same way that Lewis did, but the biblical worldview is very, very uh, important and very, very potent in his writings, and you can't fully understand them without realizing that that's where he was coming from. And so uh, it's kind of companion to deeper magic and encouraging thought. Uh, I've got 13 books total, <clears throat> but uh, those three uh, are those. Yeah, those three are, I think, the most recent and most important. Except for one, the most recent book I did uh, is called "95 Theses for a New Reformation." Uh, that came out in 2021. Mm-hmm. 95. Theses for a new Reformation. Well, well, what's wrong with the first one? Nothing, except that it's over, and the evangelical movement, which used to be the uh, primary way in which the teaching of the Reformers was transmitted to the, the current generation, has lost its way. It no longer knows who it is or what it believes or what it stands for. And uh, so... People are praying for revival, and rightly so. I am too, but I became convinced that something even more basic is needed, and that is nothing less than a second reformation can save us from ourselves as an evangelical movement right now. Uh, We need to get back in touch with the foundational truths of the first reformation and then uh, think seriously about how they apply to to the current issues that face us today. And so that's what I try to do in that book is to, uh, you know, Martin Luther's original 95 theses. I've got 95 theses for the Reformation I think we need today. Mm-hmm. And uh, shows their biblical uh, grounding. But then at, at the end talks about how do we actually put this on the ground in such a way as uh, real reformation that can lead to real revival can come to the church today. And that's where I want to pick up real quick. Um, When you talk about the church today, one of the things that I have noticed in in my my own ministry and also over these past couple of years, how ill-prepared the Western church has been and, and I use Western in a broad sense, you know, the United States, Canada, yeah. United Kingdom, you know, anywhere where people are supposed to be somewhat free and have freedom of, quote, religion, which I think is being eroded rapidly. But how many churches were prepared 
to be told they had to shut down indefinitely back in 2020. Uh, How many people just walked away from their church for good in 2020? I mean, what and how did the church respond? How did the church keep evangelizing during a time when their doors were shut? And, right. and and I'm telling you, Facebook Live is not going to, it is, is not a substitute for sharing the gospel. No, it's not. And, you know, the lack of understanding of the gospel, the lack of real commitment to the gospel and to Christ, that had been building up for a couple of generations was exposed by the pandemic mm-hmm. and uh, and it made it impossible well I shouldn't say that because people are capable of, of astonishing things when it comes to ignoring the truth it's right in front of them made it more difficult than it had been before to ignore the real problems that uh, were not caused but were exposed by that experience of going through the, the virus which you know, and all the fallout that came from it you know, and I, I think today one of the I'm noticing something in what I call the evangelical world and having spent as many years as I did affiliated mm-hmm. with Tacoa Falls College and their Christian radio and right. watching the changes since basically the 1980s in Christian radio. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, there seems to be what I call a cheapening of the theology and this broadening of we just accept all kind of stuff without question. And many, I'm watching many of these so-called church leaders in the evangelical world are beginning one little piece at a time to compromise, to say, oh, yeah. oh that, well, you know, really, that's not so bad. So we don't, we don't care if you're just living together and you're not married, you know, come to church anyway. Well, there doesn't seem to be this urgency uh, of repentance and turning away from it it's disappeared from the evangelical yeah. world am i am i missing am, am i wrong in in saying that no I, I you're seeing the same thing that i was seeing uh that led me to write that book um you know hardly a week passes when some uh well-known evangelical in quotes theologian you see the, the, the ironic air quotes around that word. I do. Uh, even on radio, you should be able to see that. Um, some well-known evangelical theologian or some even better-known megachurch pastor uh, has this announced that he needs to rethink or reimagine a doctrine that has always been part of the Christian heritage, uh, a doctrine that's always been part of the evangelical heritage or an ethical position that's always been part of Christendom's. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we don't need to reimagine or rethink. We need to recommit, reground, and regroup around the truth of the gospel, which is unchanging. Um, now, the, the Protestant Reformation wasn't perfect, and the Reformers were flawed men, who made many mistakes, but I'm convinced they were right about their central thing, which was the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in a Bible that stands alone as the only infallible source of of revelation and truth about those things, and the only infallible authority we have about them. And that message was transmitted from the historical reformation of the 16th century down toward the present through such groups as as the Puritan Fathers of the 17th century, the revivalists of the first uh, Great Awakening of the 18th Mm -hmm. century. And you can trace a, a solid line from the Reformation through those two groups down to modern evangelicalism which was uh, that, and and that's another broad term that encompasses many, many denominations, but they were the uh, heirs who brought that message most faithfully into the 20th century. But around the end of the 20th century, at least by then, and moving 
into the present, now that we're a couple of decades plus into the 21st century, um, it, we've got to the point where I can't describe evangelicalism in those terms anymore. No, you can't. It has forgotten. It has forgotten. You know, in, in the 70s, we came up as a movement with glorious consensual documents like the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy, mm-hmm. the Lausanne Covenant, that uh, crystallized and focused that heritage as we'd received it. Evangelicals today have no memory of those documents or uh, of, of their content or, or, or what it was that they summarized that we stood for. And, uh, I, you know, you can't really figure out what they stand for anymore. One of, my, uh, one of my seminary professors, when he retired, was purging his library and gave me a complete run of Christianity Today from its first issue in the 1950s down mm-hmm. through the, the... And boy, has that uh, publication changed over the decades. Oh, yeah. So just dipping into those volumes is a really, really interesting way of kind of tracking the history of the movement. Uh, in the first issue, the main, argu- the main articles were written by the foremost American evangelical theologian, the foremost uh, continental evangelical theologian, and the foremost British Bible scholar. The, three, the main articles in the latest issue were written by a journalist, a journalist, and a journalist. Now, that's one way it's changed. Yeah. But, but the other thing that's interesting is you just dip into it a volume at a time, a year at a time, skim around. And it's very obvious that there were clear boundaries of what was evangelical and what was not when it started in the 50s under Carl F.H. Henry. Mm-hmm. And one by one, all the little markers about, you know, this is not genuinely evangelical, and everybody knows that, disappeared until today. You know, you can, you can question the existence of a literal historical Adam. Uh, you can question whether or not Martin Luther correctly understood the gospel as taught by the Apostle Paul. You can question justification by faith alone. You can question... Uh, the uh, complete trustworthiness and authority of Scripture. It's not that people didn't question these things before, but you couldn't question them and still claim to be an evangelical. And I'm glad you said that. I want to just... That was a clear I want to interject something right here. That put you outside the movement. Today, it's hard to find anything that could legitimately... M- mark you as outside the boundaries of evangelicalism. If it has no boundaries, it's come to mean nothing. It doesn't stand for anything. That's anymore. right. That's right. And and you're saying, you know, I, I hear this a lot. There, there are two things that I want to quickly interject here and then get you to comment on. Number one, mm-hmm. I, I, when you look at the formerly many faithful mainline churches of 50 or 100 years ago, the evangelical movement in the United States really caught on in the 60s and 70s in response to the beginnings of the subtle changes occurring among like Episcopalians and some Presbyterians, some Methodists and some Lutherans. I mean, there was a response to, you know, you're you're moving away from the inerrancy of Scripture. You're moving away from the basic beliefs that we have been handed down since literally the first century church, and you're beginning to to secularize it. And then, and the other thing that I hear a lot, and this comes from people that attend many of these, and I'm going to use this in a broad but not critical sense, even though I am being critical. There are a lot of these what I call evangelical churches that have the praise band, the gal wearing the tight blue jeans singing her love song to Jesus or whatever. It's kind of a slobbery song. The theology is thin, and this the people that go to those churches, they go there to feel good about themselves. And it's not about their giving worship. It's, I didn't get anything out of church today. And then this, these are the same people that will tell you and look you straight in the face 
And when it comes to the Bible, that's just a book written by man, and you can't trust it. And this is accepted in that world that everything is under challenge and can't be trusted. Well, if that's the case, how in the world can the church survive? And and maybe you're, you, well, I know you're right. It's time for another reformation. So kind of address what I just mentioned in some of the what I call watered down churches, uh, the, the former main mainline churches that have just walked away from the faith entirely and pretend that, you know, Jesus loves your sin more than he loves you. I mean, this is what I'm hearing. So comment on that real quick. You ask a very good question. Can the church survive? And the answer is no. And I would say in a large number of those churches, it already has not survived. That is, just because it has a steeple in its architecture Mm-hmm. and meets at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and has a religious or even evangelical name over the door doesn't make it a church. Uh, the church is where people who are committed to Christ and the gospel gather uh, to be instructed from the Word of God and to worship God and prepare themselves to go out into the world with the gospel. And uh, so a lot of these these places where people go to enjoy a rock concert and a uh, uh, motivational speech afterwards, um, their relationship to the church as described in the New Testament is rather nebulous and hard to define. Uh, So the church dies, uh, but you can't tell for a couple of generations. And what's happening is that Um, in churches that identify as evangelical, you're getting exactly the same compromises that the fundamentalists and the evangelicals objected to in the mainline churches a hundred years ago. Uh, In fact, some of those theologians questioning the authority of Scripture that, uh, that... caused the death of those denominations as any kind of of credible incarnation of biblical faith. Uh, some of those theologians that were rejected as liberal then would actually come across as pretty conservative if you went back in a time machine and dropped them down into the middle of the of the scene today. Absolutely. Uh, we uh, we uh, and it's, it's churches, it's happening in colleges and seminaries that still have, many of them that still have a reputation of being conservative, but if you pay attention to what's actually being taught, uh, you'll find that deconstruction uh, is, is seen as a legitimate tool to use to understand literature. Okay, now, This is happening in the English class, not in a theology class. Mm-hmm. And people think, well, okay, as long as it's not in the Bible class, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Because guess where people learn to read? Guess where they pick up the idea of how to read? And if you tell them that deconstruction and other uh, forms of postmodern uh, exegesis are legitimate approaches to literature, guess how they're going to read the Bible? Uh, I, I have seen this happen. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I've, I've, I've been on a lot of uh, Christian campuses over the last uh, 20, 30 years, and, and it's really interesting to go there and get into conversations with students in the cafeteria. Students in the cafeteria will tell you things that they would never say to their Bible professor in a Bible class. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and so... Uh, there's, I would, I would venture to say half of the students in conservative Christian colleges believe seriously that a document has no meaning until it's interpreted. The meaning is not given to the document by the author when he wrote it. It is conferred on it by the reader when he or she reads it. Meaning is in the eye of the interpreter. 
this is a self-evident proposition to them that doesn't even need defense. Look, I think St. Peter can't conceive. Peter of, addressed of, that. There's no no scriptures it, it up to private interpretation. <laughs> this, right. This but, is where but, we're at. But, but but they can't even conceive of another way of approaching a literary text because this is what they picked up from the way English literature is taught. This is how they've been taught to read in general. So we shouldn't be shocked if they read the Constitution that way. We shouldn't be shocked if they read the Bible that way. And most of the presidents of these Christian colleges are in that position for one reason, because they're good fundraisers. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. and, and, And as long as their faculty sign the doctrinal statement, who knows if they read it or not, but they're reading the doctrinal statement through that same set of interpretive glasses. Mm-hmm. Consequently, it can mean whatever they want it to mean. As long as they sign it and they sing the right choruses and say the right pious stuff, nobody's worried about what they're teaching in class. And yet, the students are picking up ideas in Christian college classes that absolutely and totally undermine their commitment to Scripture as God's way of telling us truth about himself, about his son, about us, and about the world. And uh, and the, the administration is just completely oblivious to what's happening under their noses, and so are the constituents, parents sending their kids to these places. And it's infinitely more dangerous there. If you go to a secular university, and I've taught in both settings, you go to a secular university, you're expecting that kind of stuff, and your guard's up. In a Christian college, it's not. And so you're more vulnerable uh, sometimes in a Christian college environment than you would have been if you'd gone to the secular university. Um so, yeah, we, we lost the culture war, and we have no idea how badly we lost it, not just in the culture, but even in the church itself, uh, where uh, theological integrity, uh, what's that? Um, it's, it's really hard to find. And my guest today is Donald T. Williams. I should say Dr. Donald T. Williams, somebody I knew for many years ago at Toccoa Falls College, recently retired. And we're talking today about some things I believe the church needs to address. It's one thing to talk about the headlines, and we do, but today I think it's time for the church to to seek reformation. If you believe in the work that we're doing here at Truth to Ponder, would you consider writing a check to Ancient Word Radio? Ancient Word Radio. And the mailing address is Truth to Ponder. 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248. That's Truth to Ponder, 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248. The city is Crestview, Crestview, Florida. And the zip code is 32536. That zip code again is 32536. More of Dr. Williams on the other side of this break. This is is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. Having a little talk with your mind. Shalom Menachem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you can get and love in a moment. In Psalm 42, verse 11, it said this, Why are you cast down my soul or my mind? Why are you disquieted within me? Now, the word for soul is also mind there in the Hebrew. So it says, why are you why are you depressed? Why are you cast down? Why are you down? Now, how many people talk to themselves? How many people talk to themselves right now? How many people enjoy talking to yourself? You find that you learn more <laughs> than talking to yourself than anyone else. Well, I'm not encouraging you to do this. Don't get me wrong. But there is something biblical about it. If It's good if it's done right. You see, we have an idea that our mind is our mind, and that's it. Our thoughts are our thoughts. This is me. This is how I am. And that's the end of it. That's what I feel. That's what I feel. But look at the scripture and understand, you know, there's something much more of so important. You see, 
very important thing. You can talk to your mind. You don't just accept your thoughts. You can question your mind. You can question your feelings. You don't have to just accept it. You know, David didn't just accept that his that he was depressed. He, he said, hey, soul, why are you depressed? Hope in God. There's something more. Have a talk. You know, we talk to people. We want to convince them. We want to change them. How about talk to your mind? Talk to your heart. Not just accept it, but talk. You don't have to be stuck with your mind. That's the good news. You can change. The word for, for repentance means a change of mind. You can change. And it all starts when you learn the secret of talking to your mind. Want more? Ask for the 10 minds. Now the free gift for you. The mystery of the temple doors. You'll love it. And sapphires with the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Special teachings, updates on Israel, world events and prophecy. And the secrets of strength and victory for every day of your life. How do you get these free gifts? All free. Well, just remember Jesus is really Hebrew name Yeshua and you dial it. That's it. Just call 1-800-YESHUA-1 and you will be blessed. But call now 1-800-YESHUA-1. I invite you to join me in bringing salvation back to God's ancient nation, Israel, and all the unreached peoples on five continents with over a billion people. It's amazing. I'm telling you the farthest way you could ever spread the gospel through shortwave radio. It's amazing. Impact the world. Just call 1-800-YESHUA-1. You'll you'll be blessed. That's 1-800-YESHUA-1. You can write me direct. Here's how. Just write to the nice Jewish boy, Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. It's a nice Jewish boy, Box 1111. Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Well, till next time, this is Jonathan Gahn saying, Shalom Anachem, talk to your mind, my friend. Peace be to you and Messiah. Or Haolam, the light of the world. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to part two of Truth to Ponder for this Thursday. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Once again, I want to thank all of you of late that have been writing and supporting this radio ministry. Uh, I just can't thank you enough uh, for your emails, your letters, and like I say, your support. It means the world to me. This is a labor of love, doing this radio program each and every day. When we started over two years ago, I didn't know how long this program would last, but here we are going into our third year of Truth to Ponder and only because of the faithfulness of you that are listening. The world faces a lot of challenges today. We can talk about the political challenges. We can talk about uh, the economic challenges. And these are some of the worst we've seen in, in literally a half a century. And we're seeing things happen before our eyes. This transformation of our nation to something that I'm finding increasingly difficult to recognize from when I started out my working career a little over 50 years ago. Time has changed. And while technology has been a great improvement, I don't think we as a people have improved that much. We no longer have a filter for many people when we speak in public. You can go to restaurants, you can go to shopping centers, and people, their their language is coarse. Their language tends to be somewhat filthy or foul and they don't care anymore and the church's response has been well weak at best there's a lot tolerated in the the name of the church these days some churches have gone totally apostate where there any resemblance to the gospel that was handed down in the early church by the early church fathers by the apostles by the early evangelists and missionaries has been tossed aside for a new modernistic church that, that believes more in what you feel than having understanding what the word faith even means. My guest today is, is Don Williams, who I know from my years at Toccoa Falls College, and I want to welcome you back to the program. And can you kind of address a little bit where we are today? And you were mentioning in the first part of the program your book, the ninety-five theses, you know, the, your your blueprint, your roadmap for a new reformation. Where is the state of the church? We know many of the mainline churches have gone apostate. That's just a given. And now the evangelical churches are following suit. And all I can think of is what the Bible says: a little bit of leaven can can spoil the whole thing. Is that what has happened within the church? Boy, trying to trying to 
pinpoint where we are today uh, is difficult because you're shooting at a moving target. Uh, but one thing I think has, has been pretty clear to both of us is that it's not moving in a good direction. So uh, I, I left off the last uh, segment talking about how hard it is to find theological integrity uh, there are many churches, institutions, and men who still have it and are uh, stalwart champions of the truth. But on the institutional level and at the denominational level, it is getting harder to find, and uh, it's a terrible mistake to assume it's there simply because that institution or that church has a reputation of having had it there. Uh, so... Where we are is, I think, in, uh, in in one sense, it's where the church has always been. Uh, one of the principles of the original historic Reformation was simpor reformanda. The church always needs to be reformed. It should be always reforming. Simpor reformanda, always reforming. And so the, uh, the original reformers would not have been shocked that... Uh, 500 years later, uh, another Reformation is needed. But I think that is where we are, is that we need uh, the kind of reset, the kind of um, getting back to the basics, the kind of recommitment to the gospel and the authority of Scripture that we were offered by people like Luther and Calvin in the historic Reformation, in which uh, large segments of the Church managed to receive that message. Um, we've got to put our trust in God. We've got to put our trust in God's Word. We've got to put our trust in Christ, in Christ's atonement, in Christ's Lordship, and take those things seriously in a way that is that we think we're doing, but if you understand our history, uh, if you compare, uh, for example, the lyrics of a lot of contemporary worship music with mm -hmm. the lyrics of the, the great hymns, uh, the contrast is stark. Uh, the absence of content or the replacement of content, I mean, uh, some of these, and, and by the way, I am not an enemy of contemporary Christian music. Either am I, as uh, long as it's I quite have, I have played electric bass in and written music for a contemporary worship band, okay? And there is very good stuff being done by the Gettys, by uh, people like Michael Card, uh, Aaron Peterson, uh, but the trend of an awful lot of it is that uh, we're not trying to uh, worship God in terms of the content of who he is and what he's done. We're simply trying to create a mood in the congregation. We you know, do this with lighting. Yep. With, with, I mean, it's, oh, the light it's, show, the, the, the video production, yeah. the smoke machines. And I, I, right. <laughs> there was, there was you actually know, a parody about, you know, the smoke machine, you know, that the Holy Spirit left when the smoke machine <laughs> died. And so we need to raise money for a new one. But, and then there's, um, <laughs> th there's, there's a, there's a website and, uh, called Lutheran satire. Uh, they, uh -huh. web, and, this guy oh, is a, yeah, those, this, those guys are brilliant. This, this, this the guy is conservative, Bible believing Missouri Synod, and he yeah. has an entire he has a, one of the best parodies I've ever heard in my life of today's Christian music, where you know you got it you got to look at the video where Clint Eastwood reads contemporary Christian lyrics, and you, it, it is, <laughs> and if you when you. I, I've actually played it on this program before. You know, the audio is, you know, even though the, the video is incredible, it's like cartoonish, but it is absolutely incredible. And But the message is clear, how much of today's contemporary Christian music, and I've got a friend of mine that has worked in Christian radio now for about uh, 40 years, almost almost 40 years. Yeah. And, and he was telling me that he was, that he's known a lot of Christian artists and he had a conversation with one not that many, maybe maybe three years ago. 
And he said they, they were under contract to their label and they have to produce so many records, you know, or recordings every so mm-hmm. often. And some of the stuff that they wanted to produce, their producers or their, their their label is saying, we don't want you to record that. There's too much Jesus in that music and they don't want it. They want it to be just, you know, minimized so it can be a crossover hit in, in adult contemporary music. We don't want to have all this Jesus stuff or Christian stuff. They want it to be elusive, like, you're my best friend. I love you more than anyone. They want it to be almost like a slobbery love song. They don't the want closest, the name of Christ. The closest I ever came to walking out of a church um, was uh, a church of a denomination that will remain anonymous. All right. Uh, anyway, the the uh, worship song, the lyrics... I kid you not, because I have they were burned into my brain, and I have not been able to forget them. God is good. God is great. God is cool, and he's my mate. Okay, now, that would be a, that would be setting off alarm bells with me. Now, let's not I mean, let's not get off on uh, criticizing the the contemporary music thing, which is easy to do. Mm-hmm. And let's let's not forget the point, which is compare that to John Wesley's uh, hymns, mm-hmm. like uh, "And Can It Be," and ask yourself what happened. Mm-hmm. Whatever happened to hymns like "Built on the Rock, the Church Thus Stand, Even When Steeples Are Falling"? Yeah, I mean, uh, we, our theology has been cheapened by the lyrics it's not so much the music it's the lyrics is our god so uh you go from 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 hymns like that you go from and can it be that i should gain an interest in the savior's blood to the the absence of real theological content and if it's there it's liable to be heretical Mm -hmm. uh and uh, there, there was a spiritual backbone tied to a sanctified intellect mm-hmm. that was characteristic of our ancestors, and which you can see if you simp- if you read their sermons, if you read their uh, worship music, and just compare it. To what we have yes. now, mm-hmm. the, the contrast is stark. And the question then is, where are we, you ask? Uh, well, we're where the church has always been, simple reformanda, we need to be reformed, but we're not moving in a good direction. And that movement really needs to be halted and reversed. Uh, how do you do that? Um Good Man. question. Uh, uh, the the best answer I can come up with uh, is one that goes back to uh, Dwight L. Moody, who said that if you want God to send revival, and I think the same thing applies to Reformation, if you want God to send revival, Moody said, draw a circle around the chair you're sitting in and ask God to send one in that circle. You know, today... And, and we've alluded to this before, and I've talked about this numerous times on this program. Mm-hmm. I, I deal with, I've, I've dealt with people as a pastor myself that will tell you things like, well, the Bible's just a book written by a bunch of men, so you really can't trust it. It's not, it's not really accurate. It, it's got some good thoughts and things in it. Um, and we know more in science today, and the more that science reveals itself to me, the more organization and design I see, and to say that mm-hmm. this is all random. Yet we, we have divorced ourselves mentally from being able to have rational thought any longer. Um, Today, and I see this in high school students, recent high school grads, mm-hmm. you, you make a statement like, well, you know, two plus three is always going to equal five. It can't equal seven or 19. And they'll look you straight in the eye and said, well, if you really believe that it does, it can. You know, that's just your opinion. And I'm, mm-hmm. looking, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not making a joke of this. This is true. 
There are yeah. people that believe that even math is subject to your feelings and mm-hmm. what you feel today. The way you live your life, the way you deal with your job, the de- the way you deal with your marriage, it's how I feel today. And it's been carried into the church where I've listened to many a person tell me, well, I went to church today and I didn't. it didn't make me feel any better. And so I'm not coming back. There's nothing in there for me. I didn't get anything out of it. And the question I put in is, <laughs> what did you put into it? Well, that's not yeah, what I'm there for. Good. They think they're there to receive something to feel good about. And and they're trying. I'm sorry. This is not a motivational speech, like you said, with a rock concert, and the mood shifting light show and videos and all this stuff to grab. Emotions are fleeting, and this is one of the issues that I had years ago with even within the evangelical church of 40 years ago, when you preach to play on emotions, it is only for the moment. You need to be something deeper that people can latch onto that transcends somebody's emotions. Right. <laughs> we, are, we are reaping the harvest that's been sowed for at least 40 years. Oh, I and, agree. Uh, Look, there and, was a time the Southern Baptist Church was one of the fastest growing churches in the United States, if not the mm-hmm. fastest. Now they're one of the fastest declining. And, and many of these new community churches that pop up with the guy with the blue jeans well, they're really Southern Baptist churches that don't want to call themselves Baptist, and they're doing anything to stop the hemorrhaging of people leaving. Mm-hmm. Except they never understood why they were leaving in the first place. And what would that be? I'm going to pose that question. I think that's something that when you said that, it triggers. Why did people start leaving the church? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, one is because... Uh, and one is not a bad thing. It's that nominal Christianity is disappearing. Now, if you live in the South, like you and I do, you can easily miss this. But if you spend time in any other segment of the country, you realize that that uh, there's no reason to go to church anymore if you don't actually believe. It used to be it was part of basic respectability that, to be a church member. Mm-hmm. And, and go to church on Sunday. But that's gone. And so lots of people are leaving because uh, why wouldn't they? They no longer have any reason to go out of their way to go to something they're not really committed to and never were. Uh, there's another group that's leaving because the church is no longer giving them what it's supposed to. I mean, they're looking for... Uh, and they may not understand it. They may even, some of them, express it in terms of feelings, because that's the only language that the culture has given them. But what they're looking for is edification and discipleship. And why should they keep going someplace that isn't offering that? Mm-hmm. Or that's, that's pretending to, but isn't. You know, so, some of the people who say, they ex- some of them express it in terms of feeling, because that's what they're really after. But uh, there, there, there's no reason for people who aren't disciples of Jesus to go to church anymore. And so the nuns, no religion is the fastest growing segment of society. They're basically just eating up all the people who used to look like Christians but never were. Mm-hmm. But and- now, why, why would people who are disciples of Jesus go to these churches? Well, and some they shouldn't. Uh, I mean, they're, yeah. if they're not being fed the, 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 the true word of God, you're right. Why should they be there when, when it's become, no. hey, well, look, I'll, I'll just call it out. I don't care. You, you have some denominations, some parts of the Lutheran churches, some parts of the Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, the Episcopal Church in general. They, they're more concerned about the culture than they are about the gospel. And they have pushed the gospel aside or reinvented the gospel to be in touch and in feelings with the culture of today, mm-hmm. which is constantly morphing. I mean, you got the Episcopal Church wanting to bless abortion clinics. Hey, let's do more same-sex weddings. Everything against the scripture they're adopting mm-hmm. as part of their theology because they have decided that that Bible is just a book written by a bunch of men, and you know it's you know it's it's really not trustworthy. We have a new revelation today 
And I, I'm reminded, what does the scripture tell us about these, quote, new revelations or these other gospels? They're an anathema, yet people are falling for them. How does the yeah. church, I think the weakest place in the church today, and we're, we're going to be running out of time shortly, and I want you to hit on this because this is part of your background. I believe the church and many Christian colleges, not all, but too many of them, have fallen short in the area of apologetics. And, and I think the reason, in my opinion, is because they don't even know what they believe anymore. So how do you defend what you can't define? Now, can you address apologetics and what does the remnant of the church need to be doing? Well, yeah, I was uh, just thinking that we've spent practically our whole time talking about uh, the 95 Theses and the issues that 95 Theses for a New Reformation and the issues that that are raised by that book. But the other books that we mentioned are, are also relevant to this topic, and the, the one on apologetics, the Unchristian Survival Guide is a perfect example. Apologetics comes from 1 Peter 3.15, uh, which we almost always uh, quote out of context. You know, always be ready to uh, give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you. Um, and and we, we misquote it in exactly the same way that we misquote the Great Commission, uh, because we don't pay attention to what the imperative verb is. So in the Great Commission, the, the, the imperative verb is not go. It's make disciples. And so uh, we treat it like the imperative is to go, or we treat it like it's to make converts. But the actual imperative verb is that as you're going into the whole world, make disciples of every nation. Make disciples of every nation. And then Jesus defines what that is, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So a disciple is a person who has publicly identified himself with Christ and his church, mm -hmm through confession and baptism, and is in the lifelong process of learning to obey all of Jesus' commands. Uh, and it, one of the great ironies, of course, and I address this in the 95 Theses book, is the movement that named itself after the gospel, evangelical, the movement that calls itself Great Commission Christians, isn't even trying to fulfill the Great Commission because it's out trying to make converts. Well, it's just like the Gospel Coalition is no longer really the Gospel. You know, the, the, what Gospel are they be, being a coalition of? Is my question well, today. They, yeah, the, the making converts is necessary, obviously. But converting you have to, to make what? a convert in order to make a disciple. But if you haven't made a disciple, you haven't fulfilled the Great Commission. Okay, and we act like we have. You know, it, it's it's how many notches can we make in our uh, evangelism belt for our discipleship committee, and then we report in the in the uh, years in service how many conversions we had, and where are all these alleged converts? Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. a single one of them is present in the building. Now, before we so, run out of time, I want to just we're going to be running short here. And okay. anybody that's listened, yeah, back, I want to make sure people know how to contact you or find out more about the work that you have been doing and are doing. And in just like my retirement and your retirement, we're staying busier than I think we did before. So the easiest way to order the books is just to look for me on Amazon, Donald T. Williams. Mm -hmm. And and you'll see the titles we've been talking about and a few others. Um. And uh, so Donald T. Williams, you can look at it that way under under Amazon. Any other yeah. way they can find out a little bit more about some of the work that uh, you have done? You could go to my website, uh, which is DonaldTWilliams.com. One word. DonaldTWilliams.com. Uh, yeah, one word. Uh, or uh, if you're interested in, in having me come and, and, and talk about some of these things to your school or your group or your church, my email address is dt 
TW Delta Tango Whiskey at TSC, Tango Foxtrot Charlie dot EDU, DTW at TSC dot EDU. Which is at Tacoa Falls address. Right. Right. Uh, back to apologetics if we got time. Cause we got, you did yeah, ask about got a couple that. of moments here. Uh, the imperative verb is sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is within you. Apologetic starts with Christ being Lord of your heart, and the word heart in Scripture doesn't mean what it means in modern English. For us, heart is the seat of the emotions. In the Bible, the heart is the core of the personality, the unity from which intellect, emotion, and will uh, 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 come out and emerge, the place where they find their unity. Christ is Lord of that. The result is you're able to defend the faith. It's a fruit of the Lordship of Christ. And uh, apologetics would be healthier, and it would contribute to Reformation more than it does if we would understand that important truth about it. And my guest today is Dr. Donald T. Williams. I'm so glad that you could make the time to be with me on the program today. This has been quite a conversation, and I hope that maybe it was good to take a little break from the news headlines. We can talk politics. We can talk pandemic. We can talk the lies. We can talk about all the dangers and the tribulations ahead. But if we are not grounded in our faith, if we are not prepared to defend what we believe as Christians, how are we going to survive and persuade the world around us? I don't think we can. And that's why I wanted Dr. Williams on the program today. We saw during the pandemic how many churches were marginal. In other words, they really didn't have an impact on people's lives. And it didn't take much for them to close their doors. And in many cases, close their doors for good. Now, Dr. Williams has been a pastor and a church planter and a professor and a teacher and an author. And that's why I wanted him on the program today. If you believe in the ministry that we have here at Truth to Ponder, it's not just a ministry of news and information. I think we need to be spending some time encouraging the body of Christ to be to be more informed of our own faith. As I mentioned in the conversation that I had just a moment ago with Dr. Williams, I meet people all the time that claim to be Christians but they have never spent any significant time in God's Word. Oh, they've read a few of the contemporary authors that talk about how to be prosperous and feel good and have nothing but fun in your life. And then they wonder why everything is so dry and and so dismal and so empty and why they don't get anything out of going to church. And I believe that until we really come to terms with our faith, really learn about our faith, and learn what it really means to worship, we're going to be in a very bad way for a very long time. So that's why I brought Dr. Williams on the program today. Do you believe in the work that we're doing in trying to give you news, information, and yes, even things like we had today on how to defend and understand your faith? Would you consider supporting this radio ministry? Would you consider writing a check to Ancient Word Radio? That's Ancient Word Radio. The mailing address is Truth to Ponder. 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248. That's 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248. The city is Crestview, Crestview, Florida. And the zip code is 32536. Once again, 5753 Highway 85 North, number 3248, Crestview, Florida, 32536. If you go to our website, truth2ponder.com, that is truth2ponder.com, you can find other ways to support this radio ministry. It is because of your faithfulness we remain on the air. So I'm going to thank you in advance for all that you have done and will continue to do. And until tomorrow, may God bless you. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. 
To find out more, visit our website, Truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's Truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.